The Kingdom of the Worm Forward. This tale was suggested by the reading of The Voyages and Travels of Sir John Maundeville, in which the fantastic realm of Abchaz and the darkness-covered province of Hanison are actually described. I recommend this colourful fourteenth-century book to lovers of fantasy. Sir John even tells in one chapter how diamonds propagate themselves. Truly, the world was a wonderful place in those times, when almost everyone believed in the verity of such marvels. Now in his journeying, Sir John Maundeville had passed well to one side of that remarkable province in the kingdom of Abchaz, which was called Hanison, and, unless he was greatly deceived by those of whom he had inquired the way, could deem himself within two days' travel of that neighbouring realm of Georgia. He had seen the river that flowed out from Hanison, a land of hostile idolaters on which there lay the curse of perpetual darkness, and wherein, it was told, the voices of people, the crowing of cocks, and the neighing of horses had sometimes been heard by those who approached its confines. But he had not paused to investigate the verity of these marvels since the direct route of his journey was through another region, and also Hannison was a place into which no man, not even the most hardy, would care to enter without need. However, as he pursued his wayfaring with the two Armenian Christians who formed his retinue, he began to hear from the inhabitants of that portion of Abjaz the rumour of an equally dread domain, named Anchar, lying before him on the road to Georgia. The tales they told were both vague and frightful, and were of varying import. Some said that this country was a desolation, peopled only by the likes of the dead and by loathly phantoms, others that it was subject to the ghouls and afrits who devoured the dead and would suffer no living mortal to trespass upon their dominions, and still others spoke of things all too hideous to be described and of dire necromancies that prevailed even as the might of emperors doth prevail in more usually ordered lands. And the tales agreed only in this, that Anchar had been within mortal memory one of the fairest domains of Abchaz, but had been utterly laid waste by an unknown pestilence, so that its high cities and broad fields were long since abandoned to the desert, and to such devils and other creatures as inhabit waste places, and the tellers of the tales agreed in warning Sir John to avoid this region, and to take the road which ran deviously to the north of Anchar, for Anchar was a place into which no man had gone in latter times. The good knight listened gravely to all these, as was his wont, but being a stout Christian, and valorous withal, he would not suffer them to deter him from his purpose. Even when the last inhabited village had been left behind, and he came to the division of the ways, and saw verily that the highway into Anchar had not been trodden by man or beast for generations, he refused to change his intention, but rode forward stoutly while the Armenians followed with much protest and some trepidation. Howbeit he was not blind to the sundry disagreeable tokens that began to declare themselves along the way. There were neither trees, herbs, nor lichens anywhere, such as would grow in any wholesome land, but low hills mottled with a leprosy of salt, and ridges bare as the bones of the dead. Anon he came to a pass where the hills were straight and steep on each hand, with pinnacled cliffs of a dark stone crumbling slowly into dust and taking shapes of wild horror and strangeness of demonry and satanry as they crumbled. There were faces in the stone, having the semblance of ghouls or goblins, that appeared to move and twist as the travellers went by, and Sir John and his companions were troubled by the aspect of these faces and by the similitudes which they bore to one another. So much alike indeed were many of them that it seemed as if their first exemplars were preceding the wayfarers, to mock them anew at each turn. And aside from those which were like ghouls or goblins, there were others having the features of heathen idols, uncouth and hideous to behold, and others still that were like the worm-gnawed visages of the dead, 
and these also appeared to repeat themselves on every hand in a doubtful and wildering fashion. The Armenians would have turned back, for they swore that the rocks were alive and endowed with motion, in a land where naught else was living, and they sought to dissuade Sir John from his project. But he said merely, Follow me, and ye will, and rode onward among the rocks and pinnacles. Now, in the ancient dust of the unused road, they saw the tracks of a creature that was neither man nor any terrestrial beast, and the tracks were of such unwonted shape and number, and were so monstrous withal, that even Sir John was disquieted thereby. And perceiving them, the Armenians murmured more openly than before. And now, as they pursued their way, the pinnacles of the pass grew tall as giants, and were riven into the likeness of mighty limbs and bodies, some of which were headless, and others with heads of Typhian enormity, and their shadows deepened between the travellers and the sun, to more than the umbrage of shadows cast by rocks. And in the darkest depth of the ravine, Sir John and his followers met a solitary jackal, which fled them not in the manner of its kind, but passed them with articulate words, in a voice hollow and sepulchral as that of a demon, bidding them to turn back, since the land before them was an interdicted realm. All were much startled thereat, considering that this was indeed a thing of enchantment, for a jackal to speak thus, and being against nature, was for ominous of ill and peril. And the Armenians cried out, saying that they would go no further, and when the jackal had passed from sight, they fled after it, spurring their horses like men who were themselves ridden by devils. Seeing them thus abandon him, Sir John was somewhat wroth, and also he was perturbed by the warning of the jackal, and he liked not the thought of faring alone into Anchar, but trusting in our Saviour to forfend him against all harmful enchantments and the necromancies of Satan, he rode on among the rocks till he came forth at length from their misshapen shadows. And emerging thus, he saw before him a grey plain that was like the ashes of some dead land under extinguished heavens. At sight of this region his heart misgave him sorely, and he misliked it even more than the twisted faces of the rocks and riven forms of the pinnacles. For here the bones of men, of horses and camels, had marked the way with their pitiable whiteness, and the topmost branches of long-dead trees arose like supplicative arms from the sand that had sifted upon the older gardens. And here there were ruinous houses, with doors open to the high-drifting desert, and mausoleums sinking slowly in the dunes, and here, as Sir John rode forward, the sky darkened above him though not with the passage of clouds or the coming of the simoon, but rather with the strange dusk of midmost eclipse, wherein the shadows of himself and his horse were blotted out, and the tombs and houses were wan as phantoms. Sir John had not ridden much further when he met a horned viper, or Serastes, crawling toilsomely away from Anchar in the deep dust of the road and the viper spoke as it passed him, saying with a human voice, Be warned, and go not onward to Anchar, for this is a realm forbidden to all mortal beings except the dead. Now did Sir John address himself in prayer to God the Highest, and to Jesus Christ, our Saviour, and all the blessed saints, knowing surely that he had arrived in a place that was subject to satanical dominion. And while he prayed, the gloom continued to thicken, till the road before him was half-nighted and was no longer easy to discern. And though he would have still ridden on, his charger halted in the gloom and would not respond to the spur, but stood and trembled like one who is smitten with palsy. Then from the twilight that was nigh to darkness, there came gigantic figures muffled and silent and, having, as he thought, neither mouths nor eyes beneath the brow-folds of their sable cerements. They uttered no word, nor could Sir John bespeak them in the fear that came upon him, and likewise he was powerless to draw his sword, and they plucked him from his saddle with fleshless hands, 
and led him away, half swooning at the horror of their touch on paths that he perceived only with the dim senses of one who goes down into the shadow of death. And he knew not how far they led him nor in what direction, and he heard no sound as he went other than the screaming of his horse far off, like a soul in mortal dread and agony. For the footfalls of those who had taken him were soundless, and he could not tell if they were phantoms or haply were veritable demons. A coldness blew upon him, but without the whisper or soughing of wind, and the air he breathed was dense with corruption, and such odours as may emanate from a broken charnel. For a time, in the faintness that had come upon him, he saw not the things that were standing beside the way, nor the shrouded shapes that went by in funereal secrecy. Then, recovering his senses a little, he perceived that there were houses about him and the streets of a town, though these were but scantly to be discerned in the night that had fallen without bringing the stars. However, he saw, or deemed, that there were high mansions and broad thoroughfares and markets, and among them, as he went on, a building that bore the appearance of a great palace, with a façade that glimmered vaguely, and domes and turrets half swallowed up by the lowering darkness. As he neared the façade, Sir John saw that the glimmering came from within, and was cast obscurely through open doors and between broad-spaced pillars. Too feeble was the light for torch or cresset, too dim for any lamp, and Sir John marvelled amid his faintness and terror. But when he had drawn closer still, he saw that the strange gleaming was like the phosphor bred by putrefaction of a charnel. Beneath the guidance of those who held him helpless, he entered the building. They led him through a stately hall, in whose carven columns and ornate furniture the opulence of kings was manifest, and thence came into the great audience-room, with a throne of gold and ebony, set on a high dais, all of which was illumined by no other light than the glimmering of decay. And the throne was tenanted, not by any human lord or sultan, but a grey, prodigious creature, of height and bulk exceeding those of man, and having in its overswollen form the exact similitude of a charnel worm. And the worm was alone, and except for the worm and Sir John and those beings who had brought him thither, the great chamber was empty as a mausoleum of old days, whose occupants were long since consumed by corruption. Then, standing there with a horror upon him as no man had ever envisaged, Sir John became aware that the worm was scrutinizing him severely, with little eyes deep-folded in the obscene bloating of its face, and then, with a dreadful and solemn voice, it addressed him, saying, I am king of Anchar, by virtue of having conquered and devoured the mortal ruler thereof, as well as those who were his subjects. Know then that this land is mine, and that the intrusion of the living is unlawful and not readily to be condoned. The rashness and folly thou hast shown in thus coming here is verily most egregious, since thou wert warned by the peoples of Abchaz, and warned anew by the jackal and the viper which thou didst meet on the road into Anchar. Thy temerity hath earned a condign punishment, and before I suffer thee to go hence, I decree that thou shalt lie for a term among the dead, and dwell as they dwell, in a dark sepulchre, and learn the manner of their abiding, and the things which none should behold with living eyes. Yea, still alive, it shall be thine to descend and remain in the very midst of death and putrefaction for such length of time as seemeth meet to correct thy folly and punish thy presumption. Sir John was one of the worthiest knights in Christendom, and his valour was beyond controversy. But when he heard the speech of the throned worm and the judgment that had passed upon him, his fear became so excessive that once again he was nigh to swooning, and, still in this state, he was taken hence by those who had brought him to the audience-room. And somewhere in the outer darkness, in a place of tombs and graves and cenotaphs beyond the dim town, 
he was flung into a deep sepulchre of stone, and the brazen door of the sepulchre was closed upon him. Lying there through the seasonless midnight, Sir John was companioned only by an unseen cadaver, and by those ministrants of decay who were not yet wholly done with their appointed task. Himself, as one half-dead, in the sore extremity of his horror and loathing, he could not tell if it were day or night in Anchar, and in all the term of endless hours that he lay there he heard no sound other than the beating of his own heart, which soon became insufferably loud and oppressed him like the noise and tumult of a great throng. Appalled by the clamour of his heart, and affrighted by the thing which lay in perpetual silence beside him, and whelmed by the awesomeness and dire necromancy of all that had befallen him, Sir John was prone to despair, and scant was his hope of returning from that imprisonment amid the dead, or of standing once more under the sun as a living man. It was his to learn the voidness of death, to share the abomination of desolation, and to comprehend the unutterable mysteries of corruption and to do all this not as one who is a mere insensible cadaver, but with soul and body still inseparate. His flesh crept, and his spirit cringed within him, as he felt the crawling of worms that went avidly to the dwindling corpse, or came away in glutted slowness. And it seemed to Sir John, at that time, and at all times thereafter, that the condition of his sojourn in the tomb was verily to be accounted a worse thing than death. At last, when many hours or days had gone over him, leaving the tomb's darkness unchanged by the entrance of any beam or the departure of any shadow, Sir John was aware of a sullen clangour, and knew that the brazen door had been open. And now, for the first time, by the dimness of twilight that had entered the tomb, he saw in all its piteousness and repulsion the thing with which he had abode so long. In the sickness that fell upon him at this sight, he was haled forth from the sepulchre by those who had thrust him therein, and, fainting once more with the terror of their touch, and shrinking from their gigantic shadowy stature and cerements whose black folds revealed no human visage or form, he was led through Anchar along the road whereby he had come into that dolorous realm. His guides were silent as before, and the gloom which lay upon the land was even as when he had entered it, and was like the umbrage of some eternal occultation. But at length, in the very place where he had been taken captive, he was left to trace his own way and to fare alone through the land of ruinous gardens toward the defile of the crumbling rocks. Weak though he was from his confinement, and all bemazed with the things which had befallen him, he followed the road till the darkness lightened once more, and he came forth from its penumbral shadow beneath the pale sun. And somewhere in the waste he met his charger, wandering through the sunken fields that were covered up by the sand, and he mounted the charger and rode hastily away from Anchar through the pass of the strange boulders with mocking forms and faces and after a time he came once more to the northern road by which travellers commonly went to Georgia, and he was rejoined by the two Armenians who had waited on the confines of Anchar, praying for his secure deliverance. Long afterwards, when he had returned from his wayfaring in the east and among the peoples of remote isles, he told of the kingdom of Abchaz in the book that related his travels and also he wrote therein concerning the province of Hanison, But he made no mention of Anchar, that kingdom of darkness and decay, ruled by the throned worm.